work here today, here today to have a discussion with us about our um, uncertain times and how we can navigate forward through these uh, unknown circumstances. So my name is Matthew Garcia. I'm, a, I'm an associate director at the Career Center. I represent our employer relations team. And before we get started, just wanted to let you know how significant this event is. We have today a kickoff to the YU Career Center professional series, which is going to serve as many virtual events, webinars, and meetings that are going to be modeled similar to how this panel event is being modeled. Uh, for us to have discussions on very relevant topics such as the one today, as well as career preparedness support, career development support, and more. Uh, so you all are very fortunate to be a part of this as participants who will have the opportunity to, once we get our panel discussion wrapped up over the next 30 to about 45 minutes, to leave some room for there to be a bit of a um, floor for Q&A via the chat. So uh, without further ado, what I would like for our panelists to do is kind of do a, a non-traditional introduction. Um, what I'd like to know first from you all is where kind of where each of you were when this had all began for you um, and your perspective on how your role has changed or remains similar over the past few weeks to months that we've all been experiencing the pandemic in and relative to your industries and your fields. So anyone can kind of jump in and introduce themselves to talk about that perspective. Hey, this is Jason, and I'm going first. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to, to be here and to speak with you. My name is Jason Jacobs. Um, I serve as the director of digital partnerships at a ad tech company called Place Exchange. Um, in response to, uh, to Matthew's question, um, you know, thinking about when this whole thing began, um, even the weeks leading up to the current situation, uh, there was a vibe in the office that it was almost a matter of time until the situation would affect us here in the United States, in New York specifically, and how it would impact uh, people personally and professionally. Uh, and I knew that there was, a, there was a point in time when the office would probably be closed, people would be working remotely, people, schools would be closed, people would be taking care of their children at home, and it would impact how people work. Uh, a lot of my role specifically is, is meeting with external partners. Uh, it's a business development and sales role that I'm in. Um, so a lot of my role is very much external facing. Uh, I don't have the ability to meet with people, certainly face to face. I don't have the ability to uh, even, even network with people the way that I used to. Uh, people are, I, I'm finding are much less accessible. Um, there are some folks who have more time on their hands, uh, but in general I'm finding that people uh, are caught up in other responsibilities, whether it's taking care of their children, family, family members, uh, people are not 100% focused on their job. Um, so for me, it's impacted uh, my own schedule pretty significantly. Um, and we're counting down the days um, uh, very carefully until things are back to normal again, hopefully soon. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, man, I'll jump in. Uh, Barry Diner, um, an emergency physician um, here in Houston, Texas. I'm a Yeshiva College graduate in 90, 1990, so I'm aging myself. If anyone wants to sit there and figure out how old I am, I'm 52. I'll just solve the problem. Um, and um, I, I, interestingly, to hear the other panelists talk, but I, my, my role actually as an emergency physician actually hasn't changed much at all. Um, I do several different things. I do emergency medicine, I do hospice and palliative care, and I do a lot of telehealth. So actually, my, my role um, in the emergency department hasn't changed much uh, here in Houston, um, other than we've, we've done a lot of work in, pre in, pre um, in preparation um, for a spike in patients. So there's been a lot of conference calls, a lot of webinars, a lot of continuing medical education that we've had to get up to stuff on um, as an emergency physician. Um, but I've been doing telehealth now for uh, close to 10 years. Um, I think when at its infancy about a decade ago. Um, so my, my practice really hasn't changed much. And the roles, uh, I do some entrepreneurial work uh, as well in the telehealth space. Um, and that actually hasn't changed either. If anything, that, that's taken up a little bit more of my time recently because there's been this push now for, for telehealth across all different venues in, in, in healthcare, um, but in emergency medicine. Uh, thank God in, in hospice and palliative care, which I've been pushing for for years, but we needed a pandemic to affect the entire world in order to move forward with that. Um, and so it's been interesting, just uh, Mike, I, I tell people, I said, I go to work every day. Uh, most people go stay home. I get to leave my house. 
Uh, my, I don't know if my family's so thrilled about that. I, I do change when I get home. I have to strip down in the laundry room and then I go immediately to the shower. So I think that my, that part of my life has changed because usually I, I get home and I do whatever, but now I have to go immediately to the laundry room. I strip down, I have a towel in there and then I go take a shower right away so that I try not to like infect the rest of my family, which thank God everyone has been well. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Um, I guess I'll go. I'm a, Yeshiva College graduate in 1993, and uh, I am. I know how old you are now. Right. <laughs> I did the math on you too. <laughs> so I, I'm a house flipper in Long Island, New York. I live in Lawrence, and I uh, flip houses throughout uh, uh, Long Island. And uh, this uh, shutdown, the stay-at-home order, has really uh, put a dent in my business for on two ends. First of all, I, I'm cons- I was constantly marketing for people looking to sell their house and because uh, the governor declared a state of emergency, it became illegal to call people uh, or text them. So we, we had to change our marketing and do very little marketing because when we did market in the beginning of it, people really weren't interested. People are obviously scared for their health and not interested in selling their homes right now. But on the sales side, I have 10 properties, I had nine properties uh, in contract for sale and it's very hard to get things closed now because all the municipalities are closed, the courts are closed. So I have a two properties where I need somebody from the surrogates court, the surrogates court's not providing anything. I need uh, tax contingencies uh, from uh, municipalities. I can't get them. So everything's really slowed down uh, a lot. There are deals closing, but it's very, very hard. And uh, we had a couple of borrower, a couple of buyers who lost their jobs due to COVID-19. So they fell out and we had to find a uh, new buyer. So it's really had a big effect on, on my business. It slowed things down, but I am, hopeful that when it ends, um, it should be a good, uh, good situation because I think there's going to be a lot more people selling their home in the area. All right. Thank you for sharing. Hi, uh, my name is Avi Person. Um, I graduated from YU about six years ago. Um, I've mo- I moved out to the, the West Coast since then. I'm living now in California uh, and I'm working for Facebook as a uh, internal solutions engineer. Um, when this uh, when this uh, situation hit, um, you know, it was, it, it was a, a very tough time uh, specifically for our teams because they weren't really prepared for this type of thing. Even though, you know, we're an engineering company, a software company, um, there's only so much preparation you can do to, um, to plan for something like this. And, you know, during these unprecedented times, um, I think there's really two pieces to, to the work that we're doing. Um, uh, on, on one side, we're actually pushing a lot more features and we're innovating at a very fast rate just because uh, w- there's a lot of uh, need uh, to help people stay connected uh, throughout the world, right? Like during this time when you don't have that physical connection with people, um, you kind of need uh, better ways to keep in touch with people, whether it be through uh, Facebook or Instagram or, or any of our other apps. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of work being done there. Um, there's also a lot of businesses now, they don't have uh, their brick and mortar stores open, right? And so they need to uh, create online presences. And so we've done a lot of work to help them uh, from the business standpoint of, um, you know, being able to market their uh, their business properly, utilizing all the tools that they have at their disposal. Um, uh, but I, I think uh, on the other uh, side of the coin, you know, a big part of the, um, of the engineering cycle, uh, at least at Facebook, is that you plan uh, and then you uh, execute. And so the execution phase is actually moving faster than than what we had expected on my team. We're actually pushing out a lot more than we had expected, but the planning phase is a little bit more difficult because that requires that human touch and, you know, being able to communicate with other people at your team and across the organization, which is obviously a lot more difficult to do during this time. Gotcha. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for each of you for introducing yourselves and sharing with us how it is that, uh, all, the, all of these kinds of uh, circumstances have impacted your work and, and really your livelihood in order to um, go in the direction that you'd like to go, which is forward with your careers and forward with, with serving those of your, uh, of your colleagues, constituents, et cetera. Um, I, I, so the, for the next question, there's, there, it's about kind of forecasting in a way, and it's very difficult to forecast everything, which is understandable. Um, but in each of your experiences, when you do have downtime, what are you thinking about in the short term and long term about how your work may be impacted in the future 
and how your industry may be impacted in the future, either in the short term or the long term, by this pandemic. And anyone anyone can begin. I'll go first. So uh, as I said, uh, I think this is going to be really good for my business when it's over. Right now, it's having a huge effect and slowing things down terribly. But I think that uh, at least in New York, which is probably going to be one of the latest areas to open, um, there's going to be a lot of economic uh, impact from the shutdown. And I think there's going to be a lot of people who are looking to sell their homes and who are willing to sell them at a discount so I can buy them. Um, so I think it'll be very good. I just We just need to get to a point where it, it, I'm physically able to uh, get to closings where attorneys, uh, municipalities, title companies, and and um, courts are open. So I think it's going to be great for me in the, in the future. And what I've been doing during this downtime is I'm working on expanding to other markets in the country. So uh, a couple of Midwestern cities where, where they don't feel the same uh, impact uh, that they do here. Here, people are genuinely scared for their lives. I think in other parts of the country, real estate is still going on. So I've expanded, actually built an education product to teach other people to do what I do and um, trying to sell that just as another stream of income. So try to use this downtime to uh, help my business going forward. Gotcha. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay. I think that um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go next. Is, uh, I think that we're going to, healthcare is going to be very different, I think, moving forward. I think that this has exposed the, the United States to a lot of um, um, problems that we have in healthcare system. Um, I'm originally Canadian. Um, I think that I think that that, the, the, that we're going to be looking very much at a single payer system or some type of national healthcare system because the system fell apart and is falling apart, specifically in New York. And the rest of the country doesn't seem to be helping. Um, some cities in the Midwest and the South, like New Orleans, all of these, some certainly have really been hit hard from a, from a healthcare perspective. And I think we're going to see some changes. Um, I don't know, most people don't really realize this, but outside of the, the New York and maybe De uh, Detroit and New Orleans, healthcare has been decimated across the country. Our volumes are down 30, 40, even 50% in most hospitals. Revenue hasn't been come in. Um, emergency physicians, even though we're quote unquote on the front lines, have taken almost a 30% financial hit across the board, um, even though we're expected to show up to work every day. Um, you know, uh, healthcare in America is owned mostly by large corporations that have taken on a huge amount of debt in order to grow, which are owned by a lot of venture capitals. KKK, for example, owns one of the largest emergency medicine groups. Um, and um, and uh, they have debt to play. And the only way that they can pay that debt moving forward is by cutting physician salaries. Um, so I think that we're going to see there's going to be some type of swing in healthcare. I, I, I can't imagine it doesn't. Um, the other part of it, I think that you're also going to see we're going to move technology from a telehealth perspective, I think, ahead like 10 years. Like it's really going to move quickly. Um, I'm not so sure that the steps that the government has taken to implement health, uh, telehealth across the country that they're going to be actually be able to pull back so easily on, on a lot of the, the immediate changes they made to health, um, to legislation. Um, so I think that if people are looking for a uh, health play, I think it's in the telehealth perspective. Um, I'm not so sure that I would get into the hospital um, play of uh, health care because I think that that's going to be really rough moving forward. Um, just to give you an example, uh, Texas Children's, which is the largest pediatric healthcare provider in the world probably, but for sure in the United States, um, is, is expecting to lose uh, $400 million in this quarter, which is a huge number. Um, so, you know, everyone's being asked to, to chip in for that, uh, to that downfile, uh, as along with other industries, but uh, healthcare affects everybody. The, the insurance companies are going to be the ones that run away with a huge amount of upside uh, in the next couple of quarters where they keep on getting premiums from, from patients, uh, yeah. but they're not paying it out because people aren't going to hospitals and they're not getting any elective care. Gotcha. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Yeah, this is Jason. Happy to go next. Um, you know, for, for my current role, and I, I've worked in digital advertising for 10 plus years or so now, um, and I've worked in a number of different digital areas and digital channels. Uh, currently right now, my company that I work for called Place Exchange is focused on what's called the out of home space. 
And what out of home means is basically any advertising uh, that wouldn't be in the, in the walls of your home. So everything from you know, billboards, like something in Times Square or billboards on the side of highways, uh, billboards in transit authorities, uh, kiosks in stores, in gyms and college campuses, really any out of home digital screen. Essentially what we provide is a technology that allows advertisers to, to buy that media in more of an automated real-time fashion, uh, the same way they're buying that media online on the web um, or in mobile apps or things like that. Um, so we're able to provide that technology and out of home was slated to grow at a tremendously high rate in 2020 and expected to grow even more in 2021. However, with the whole coronavirus COVID-19 situation, people aren't going out of home. Right, people are staying in their homes more and more. Um, so many advertisers who would have allocated part of their marketing budget, and we're talking you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to the out of home space, are reallocating that or just pulling it back and saving that money entirely. Um, so that is, it took a tremendous impact on our business. Um, for the second quarter of the year, which we're in right now, uh, across the board, our, they cut our salaries by 20%. Um, and our CEO uh, sat with us and said, uh, you know, what if we didn't bring in any revenue for the entire quarter? Basically a worst case scenario where basically zero dollars were to come in for the next three months. How would we survive going forward after that? Um, and we'd be able to take that 20% of salaries and that would get us through one quarter without any revenue. But what happens if this goes into the third quarter and the fourth quarter? You know, at some point, uh, the company has to find other ways uh, of saving money. You know, looking at you know how do we cut expenses from our utilities, from the rent that we're paying for the office, um, things like that. There's other you know basically counting every single dollar in order to make sure we can sustain ourselves. Uh, many companies that have a lot of debt are the ones that are going to struggle the most and have to take more immediate action. Companies that don't have as much debt but re but rely on you know incoming revenue to pay bills um, could last a little bit longer, but at some point it catches up to them as well. Um, so just yeah, just in some, so in our, in our field, this hit us pretty significantly. Um, in many other areas though, of digital advertising, for example, connected TV. Um, so those of you who watch Hulu, if you watch the ad supported version of Hulu, things like that are seeing an increase in marketing dollars. They're very strong because people are home. They're just watching TV. In many cases, there's, you know, 30 plus million people who are not even working or unemployed now, who are probably spending a lot of time just trying to pass the time being stuck at home. Um, so there are certain areas within advertising and marketing that are seeing a, a tremendous increase, but then other areas like out of home that are really being hit hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think as an engineer um, in my role, we're, we're actually quite fortunate in the sense that uh, the current situation, uh, I don't see that it has changed much in terms of my day to day, and I don't see that it will change it much. Uh, just because um, when, when you work at like Facebook, which is like a global company, a large, a large percentage of your time is actually not spent communicating with people uh, in person. Um, you know, I, I communicate with people all across the world. Um, in di different offices throughout our country and, um, and, and in other places as well. And so we, we already have a lot of the tools that, that would be necessary to make that, um, that communication efficient uh, and work. Um, so I guess from a day-to-day -day perspective, uh, not much has changed in terms of like what I'm doing every day and what kind of, um, what kind of things I'm focusing on. Uh, a couple of the changes that have happened are in terms of the road mapping and priorities, uh, right? Because this, this has impacted the business uh, at a very high level. And so that starts to trickle down uh, to all the various teams in terms of like, what are they working on? So, you know, we, we had to reevaluate all the priorities that we had um, for the, to deliver for this app uh, and change them accordingly to ensure that we're uh, keeping up with the business's needs. Um, and that often requires us to, um, to, to work uh, a little bit more to ensure that we're able to uh, develop and, and push out that, that code and ensure that we have communication with all of the, the, the proper partners. Um, but in terms of the actual work that we're doing, um, I feel like we're, we were positioned uh, in a pretty good place to be able to, um, to do that work remotely. So. Awesome, awesome. Thank you each for sharing and, and so, what, what we're hearing everybody who's in attendance is there's a lot of ways that industries and fields have been impacted similarly and differently. So something to keep in mind is, uh, going forward as you're listening is to consider um, your own industry interests and, and, and field interests of where you're headed because 
where this conversation is now going to go is uh, uh, I'm going to ask each of our panelists, uh, based on what they've shared so far, how it is that um, how it is that hiring may be affected or personnel may be affected as far as um, you know those who are as you, as you may in the group be seeking opportunities. So I wanted to start with Avi since you had spoke, spoken most recently. Seems like you had an infrastructure there that was ready for transition uh, in response to the, to the pandemic. Has there also been an infrastructure uh, in place for being prepared to either um, hold on hiring or hold on or, or change rather how it is that new personnel would be recruited and put into positions where there are needs to hire? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I wouldn't say that there's any um, any holds on hiring. In fact, we're we're actually aggressively hiring in specific areas. Um, now, I think it's about uh, prioritizing, right? So, um, you know, based on the current circumstances, there are specific priorities that the business wants to hit, and so we we are uh, aggressively hiring in those in those areas and um, to help support those those teams and those tools. Um, now, we're also mindful of the fact that you know you don't want to just um, higher across the board for all different kinds of roles equally. And so there, um, you know, there may be hiring, um, there, there may be more mindful hiring in certain areas as well, um, just so that, you know, we could scale, we can scale the, the teams properly. Um, but, but across the board, there has been no stop in hiring. We're, we're actually onboarding um, two new people to my team uh, just this week. Uh, now the onboarding procedure is is quite interesting when it's all done remotely, uh, right? Because you don't even meet your team in person. Um, the whole interview process is done uh, over VC. Um, you get all your equipment like sent to you. Uh, we don't know how long that's going to last, and so that experience is is something new uh, to the company, to our team. Uh, but we're we're making our ways through it, and um, we're trying to support uh, the new people um, as much as we can throughout that process. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Now, Mr. Pinter, uh, your industry and your field in which you work is a little is a little different by comparison because it does involve much of this in-person touch uh, in such a way because you're, you're involved in real estate and seeing a home is different than doing a virtual tour of a home and, and much of what you're doing is integrated together in order to accomplish your role. So how would you say that anyone who's interested in considering opportunities in, in real estate, however different or similar to what you do, should be anticipating to prepare for uh, if they want to make that jump starting this summer or in the next six to 12 months? I'm hoping uh, by the summer, at least the end of the summer, things will be back more, more normal than they are now. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the houses that we sell, so we, uh, as I said before, I had uh, two properties in contract that fell out because the buyers lost their job due to due to the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So we put them back on the market and we we left them vacant and people went to see them. We gave them the lockbox code. So that worked out well because I think they're both going to be back in contract shortly. Mm -hmm. But um, under if you're to, if you're still talking about how it's going to change, I, I'm I'm not. I hope it's going to be back to normal the way it was. Right. Um, but a lot of pe the people that work for me are virtually virtual anyway. I have a bunch of people in the Philippines. Um, Mm -hmm. do a lot of the back end work for me or do marketing for me. So it hasn't really affected my hiring at all. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that real estate soon will be back to where it was before. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Jason, as, 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 when we had last worked together a couple months ago, you had been in, in a digital marketing role and then now have since shifted to a new opportunity. So first of all, congratulations. And um, second of all, as far as your perspective on, on, hiring and seeing your teams change and, and how they do their work. How do you anticipate that students, graduates, uh, or alumni who are in this call with us are, uh, should be prepared to consider making their own transitions in roles while uh, this is kind of at its, at its height right now as far as the coronavirus is impacting, impacting us all in our work? Sure. Uh, I mean, just to speak to you know, what's going on at my current uh, company, uh, we had a number of, of positions that were open um, for the last number of weeks, uh, in some cases months, uh, trying to find the right person. Within my group, specifically, we had three people who, uh, three roles that are open, and uh, all those are on hold now. We have a full hiring freeze you know, throughout the company. Um, I think initially when this was sort of just coming our way in the beginning of, you know, end of February, beginning of March, um, it was more about the fact that we couldn't interview people face to face and wanting to meet somebody before hiring them. Um, Avi spoke about, you know, Facebook doing more digital and, and virtual interviews. Um, 
it depends on the company. Some companies are okay with that or just okay having a conversation, just like a, a Zoom session or a Gchat session. And uh, they're talking and they can you know, hire someone based on that. Um, many times you like to actually you know, meet the person first, even if it's a final step where you have the initial conversations over video or over phone. Um, and we weren't able to do that. And now obviously as things have progressed, it became more of a financial consideration where we implemented this hiring freeze really is to say, you know, where are we going to emerge financially from this and how strong are we and are we, do we still have the ability to hire. Um, you mentioned my transition in my own professional life. Uh, before my current role, uh, I was a director of digital partnerships for Bed Bath & Beyond, where I had a team of eight people there, uh, and we were also were hiring. Uh, I'm still very much in touch with the folks there um, who I stayed close with, and uh, Bed Bath & Beyond has furloughed uh, about 60% of the corporate campus, not just the in-store employees. Um, and in many cases, um, they've taken uh, pay cuts for executives and leadership folks um, who are still working, but now at a reduced salary. So um, I think, you know, in many ca cases, I think it's going to be somewhat challenging, depending on the industry and the vertical, um, to be able to get interviews for a short period of time. Um, but I will say is, and just I'll add, I'll add to that as well, you know, when I graduated, uh, I graduated in uh, towards the end of 2009, um, which was basically you know, about a year or so after the, uh, the recession that took place throughout the country. And uh, you know, for, from those who were just a year or two older than myself, um, who were graduating during that recession, all I kept hearing about was there's no jobs, there's no jobs, how do I get a job? So when I graduated, there was still a little bit of that mindset of just how do I get a job? Um, I think for those graduating now, uh, at the end of this year, um, specifically, you'll probably have some of those same challenges, which is companies who are reluctant to hire just until they figure things out. Uh, but I think the, the positive side to that is that um, what I found is that as a country, people sort of emerge stronger in many cases. And I think there's this, there's this itch for people to get back to reality and people want to resume their normal activities. Uh, so while there may be companies that are permanently affected by this, some companies that have to shut their doors, some companies that have to you know, eliminate hiring for a, a lengthy period of time, um, I think after a few months, um, whenever this period ends, whether it's in a few weeks or a few months, when we do finally open things up again and companies do that reassessment of where they are, they'll say, okay, what roles can we hire for? Kind of like what Avi was talking about, you know, what role, we don't want to hire for everything. We want to be a little more specific, but there will become roles and opportunities that are available. So my recommendation um, for those who are looking for jobs now is number one, just sort of continue pushing ahead. Uh, don't stop anything different. Don't be discouraged because it's challenging. Uh, it will be more challenging, again, depending on the industry or what, what field you want to go into. Uh, don't be discouraged by that because the opportunities will come back again. Uh, so if you don't hear back from a company for a few weeks or even a few months, there's a chance that that comes back again at some point when the company says, okay, let's look through the applicants. Now we're ready to actually hire somebody for that. Uh, so don't be discouraged by that. The second thing I would say though is, uh, is continue to uh, improve on skills that could be useful. So if you are graduating and you're not in school and you don't have any plans for the summer uh, or you find yourself with more free time, find a skill that could be useful, whether it's useful on your resume that makes you uh, more of an attractive hire or a skill that can give you something to work on. So one thing that I've done in my career, unrelated to any job that I've ever had, has been web design. I've always done web projects on the side, outside of my, my professional work for small and medium-sized businesses. And that's been, <clears throat> excuse me, something that actually took a web design class when I was in YU. And I thought that's probably my most valuable class that I took uh, because it gave me a skill that I could apply uh, outside of what I do, even when I have that downtime. Um, so I think that that's the second thing you can do is, is try to pick up a skill. It could be web design. It could be learning how to be a photographer. It could be learning a second language. It could be anything that could give you something, again, whether it's related to the field or not. And the third thing I would say is continue to work on your online sort of presence, your resume presence, uh, whether it's LinkedIn, Indeed, other job sites. Um, the, com the company that I'm at right now, uh, and I've been with uh, five different companies uh, at this point. Um, it, this is the first job that I've had that I actively applied in, and, I, and I got the job. The four companies before this, I've been fortunate enough that had somebody found me on a job site. My first job ever was from Career Builder, And then since then, it's all been from LinkedIn. Um, so I find that if you can perfect that LinkedIn presence um, and make yourself as marketable as possible, you know, checking off all the boxes. Uh, when you look at jobs on LinkedIn, quite often they tell you what skills are required for that. You know, see if you can add those keywords, those skills within your resume. If you don't have the ability to add them, see what you can learn in order to be able to do so. 
Um, so spend a lot of time there. And then at some point you may find that somebody finds you, uh, the right job finds you rather than you finding that right job. All right, sir. Thank you very much for sharing the information. And we're going to get back to that topic of what candidates can do when they're, when they are job seekers, when they're seeking internships and just overall information. But before we do, I wanted to give the floor to Barry. Now, Barry's, uh, multifaceted career in a way where he stands now with several different hats, working in telemedicine, working in education and, and working uh, as a, as a, as a, in, um, excuse me, in a clinical medicine. So Barry, if you could share uh, with all of those things in mind, how might students or, or graduates who are pre-med and, and going to medical school, how should they best prepare themselves to anticipate for what kind of market is out there to get into medicine and should they be considering having many different hats at, at one point in their career um, or specializing when it comes to being prepared for crisis response in this kind of manner? Sure. So it's, it's an interesting question from a healthcare perspective, just very different than, you know, from, a, from the other people that are on the panel, I suspect, is that, you know, we go through it, we have a lot of schools. So first of all, I could tell you that I love being a physician and anyone who's on the call of the students that want to be a physician, it's a great job, despite what you hear from a lot of other people. Um, I, I like what I do. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of work, um, but um, it's very gratifying. Um, and and, and, I, and I, I'm not ashamed to say that physicians, for the most part, are compensated fairly well. Um, so from a career path, it's also, it has a lot of security associated with it um, to, to boot. Um, I will, uh, the, the first thing that I always tell, I tell my kids this, and I have a senior graduating from high school, is the most important thing getting like getting into college, getting into med school, you got to have the grades. So you got to study hard, you got to do well in the MCAT, and you got to do well in, in, in college in order to get into med school. Um, and then once you get into med school, then it's about picking the, the, the career path that, uh, that, that you think might uh, give you the most uh, pleasure and the most satisfaction uh, from a career perspective. I think that people then have to decide where they see themselves. Again, I, I think it's important, just like if you want to be a pediatrician, you should be a pediatrician. You want to be a neurosurgeon, you should be a neurosurgeon. Um, and you should try to, to strive for that. Once you get into that specialty and then you graduate the specialty, I would do recommend, I think like, like Jason was saying, is to diversify yourself a little bit. I'm, I'm trained as an emergency physician. My specialty uh, and my degree and my uh, in, in residency was emergency medicine. Once I got into emergency medicine, though, I had the opportunity um, I had the opportunity to get involved with hospice and palliative care, which was just a fluke. Um, and then I, I was able to grandfather in and board certified in hospice and palliative care. In the meantime, I started getting involved in telemedicine. Again, it was just a colleague who suggested it to me. I got involved in it. It's been, uh, it's been a, a change in my career. I enjoy it a lot. I get to do some of it from home. I do it when I travel. I do it, I, I do it all the time. Um, I'm able to do it again from home. So it, it, it's a, it allows me to be at home. I happen to be doing it right now as we talk, because I happen to be on call for the fire department here in Houston, because um, we have a telehealth program that we work with the EMS system. And so it, it's really, um, it's a matter of how you want to position yourself. I think like any career, I don't look at it just as my position. I also am part-time faculty at Baylor. I don't just look at my, my medicine as my treating of patients, which is the most part what I do, but there's also the aspect of the business of medicine. Um, I do some medical legal work as well, which I enjoy, and I don't, I, don't, I don't go after doctors. I work with an attorney for specialists that have issues with actually jails, which is something that I never thought I would do, um, but it's fun. I actually enjoy it. It's fun. Um, and I met them through the work I do at our school, because I happen to be the president of our school, and I met them through a legal case that we had with the school and they asked me if I'd do this. And I said, oh yeah, sure. So it's again, a, I have a portfolio that's very different than a lot of physicians, but I think that that's the way the future from a, from a doctor's perspective, we can't have, it can't just be all clinical anymore. Uh, unfortunately, um, the world has changed, not because of Corona, it changed before that. Um, this has changed it even more. Um, and, I, and I think that having that diversification not only lends to satisfaction for my job, but it lends for the ability to, from a Parnassa perspective, it also helps because again, I don't have all my eggs in one basket. Um, and, uh, and I think it also, it's uh, like someone mentioned about LinkedIn, it's about networking. It's about um, uh, turning over. And, and I, when anyone says, are you interested in, the first thing that comes out of my mouth is yes. 
I always say yes to anybody because I'm willing to have a conversation with anyone about anything that has to do with uh, uh, medicine. I'll give you just a fine example. Someone said to me, uh, technology and healthcare. Anyways, I found myself on a conference call with a gentleman who's a Palestinian who lives in Tel Aviv, who deals with, who's, who, who works with technology and infectious disease. And we had an hour and a half conversation last week, um, which was extremely interesting. And, and I'm trying to move forward by networking with this individual um, um, to work on something with sexually transmitted diseases and technology, um, which actually could play into Corona, believe it or not. Um, and it, it was just a, because someone had mentioned it to me and I said, yeah, I'd love to speak to this person. And he's, he's engaging, he's brilliant, he has interesting technology. And it, it, and it applies to healthcare, which I think can make a, a huge impact uh, in preventive care, not just in America, but across the world. Thank you, sir. And, and fascinating perspectives from each of your uh, industries and fields to show our participants who are here today just how much of a fluid kind of adjustment that everybody is making and how much that has a relationship with uh, how you might navigate it as a candidate or how might you navigate uh, your path to your career goals. And um, a big question that I want to ask the, the panel as well, one of, the, one of the final questions that I would like to ask is some of, some of what was brought up are, are things that you can put in a toolbox as a candidate, right? Some of it is networking. Some of it is skill building, whether it's transferable or technical skills. Um, and then there are some that may be unique to each of you that you have used in the past. Uh, so what are some tangible things that you might be able to share with our attendees who might feel discouraged in feeling that they may not be able to do some active things for their own career development in order to achieve their career goals? What are some active things that they can have in their toolbox that they can do to stay sharp and stay prepared for opportunities to achieve such career goals in the short term or long term? And any of, any of you can, can begin and contribute. Yeah, I, I can start. I would say a couple of things um, that come to mind. You know, first is uh, if you do know um, sort of the field or vertical you want to go into, um, even if it's uh, unpaid internships, right? There are times when you can keep your skills fresh and you can learn things by really volunteering your time. Uh, while it may not sound you know, overly attractive, uh, the unpaid internship, either word may not sound attractive. You might be looking for a paid <laughs> full-time job. Um, or, or very least a paid internship, but there are times when you may not be able to get that um, and having that unpaid internship um, uh, or even volunteer experience, you know, part-time volunteering for an organization or a business looking for help uh, can teach you new things that can keep you very fresh in terms of what, what it is you want to go into. Um, I personally have hired some people like that uh, by posting on LinkedIn, uh, looking for college students or those for called one to two years experience uh, with certain skill sets, whether it's someone uh, as a full-time summer intern or someone as a part-time while they're still in school. Um, and I found, um, I found some, some poor candidates, but I found some really good candidates like that. Um, I think that's, that is definitely a great way to do that. Um, I would also say there's a fair amount of, of learning material online, and in many cases for free, where you can access you know, courses and learning material uh, relevant to all different kinds of industries. I know I found a lot on LinkedIn. There are different associations uh, for every industry that put out lots of content. So there's a lot that you can do in terms of just consuming that information. Um, and the third thing I would say is, is that networking aspect trying to talk to people uh, that are in that field, um, kind of like Barry was saying, is I, I try to do the same, which is in case someone reaches out, um, I also try very hard to have, uh, to never say no to a conversation and always have that, that, first, that first conversation just to see what it's about and what, what could come from that. Um, so if somebody reaches out to me, uh, and just last week, someone from YU reached out to me on LinkedIn to ask for, my, for, for some time just to talk. And I usually say yes to those, um, is to try to find people who have the time right now uh, to have a conversation, learn what they do, see what you can network. Um, those are all things you can do even while you're, you're struggling if you are to try to find uh, your next opportunity. All right, thank you. So I'll, I'll jump in. So I, um, so I, I, I think what uh, Jason was saying was very important. Um, I think from a medical perspective, I'd break it down into three categories. Um, there's, if medicine is something that you're considering and this is a career goal, there's a, the focus generally is research and medicine. 
education in medicine. And I think that one of the things that, that isn't uh, pushed enough, which is the financial aspect of medicine. Just, just keep in mind that, that United States healthcare is the single largest industry in the world. There's not a bigger industry in the world. It's $3 trillion a year. Okay, it's, it's probably mo bigger budget than most countries in the world. So there's a lot of business and finance that goes on along with healthcare. One of the things which I'm actually, it's unfortunate that when I went to YU, it didn't exist, but there's a, you can get now, I think, I think you can in, the, in um, Sci Sims, you can do data analytics, which I would, I, anyone who's on the panel right now will tell you it's, everything's about data nowadays. It doesn't matter if it's healthcare or if it's Facebook or if it's advertising or if it's, or if it's real estate. Everyone needs to know the data. And, it, and the same is true in healthcare. Um, I met a guy that when I went up to interview with my son this year um, for YU, um, and please God, in a year after he spends a year in Israel, he'll be at YU. Um, he's doing a double major of biology and data, data analytics. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy's like, he's gonna kill it. So he's either gonna do, he's either gonna go and become, you know, he's gonna go into residency and he's gonna, I don't know, do, become a doctor doing something. He's, and he's gonna either do research or with that analytics, he's going to get picked up by any healthcare firm. Uh, if it's a consulting firm or if it's, uh, it's one of the big uh, players in the healthcare industry and his, with his data analytics, he's going he's gonna to secure an amazing job. So he's, he, his ability to now go and do something is he can either go into clinical medicine, he can go into research, he can go into education, he can go into the business of medicine. So it really diversifies his portfolio a lot. Um, and I was actually quite impressed by that. Um, I think the data analytics is in any field could, is, uh, is the future. We all talk about data, you know, in, in telehealth, there's a company out of Israel called K health, which they do artificial intelligence and telehealth. Um, brilliant. Um, it's not the whole case of doing telemedicine. They're not, uh, they haven't invented it, but the fact that they've invented uh, artificial intelligence using the database from one of the Kupas in Israel, um, and that they could do that, they have all these algorithms in the back end is unbelievable from a telehealth perspective. And that's where their value is from a company. Uh, isn't so much the telehealth. The telehealth is almost like we're doing right now, Zoom. Um, but the fact that they, that they have that background from data is, is, is remarkable. Um, so that's what I, you know, I think that people should, you should, when they focus on that, where do they want to do? What do they want to do on their off time? Think about education, about teaching, think about research, think about data. Think about business um, when it comes to healthcare. All right, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I can go next. Um, so I think the two pieces of advice I would give during this time uh, in terms of tangible things that you can do while you're uh, spending a lot of time at home um, is uh, the first one has to do with the, uh, the technical interview process. Um, and this is something that you don't necessarily um, learn too much about in university. Uh, but a lot of tech uh, companies have um, the same technical component to every um, interview, no matter what company you're going to, you're applying to. Um, they, they may ask you different technical questions, but the gist of those questions is something um, that you really need to, um, to study. Um, so there's different books out there. One of them is called Cracking the Coding Interview. Um, there's a lot of websites that uh, provide you with uh, different riddles and questions that you can answer. Um, but it's just really important to practice, right? You're, you're not going to get everything or every question that, or prepare for every question or memorize every question, but it's important to understand the process of how to answer these questions. Because when you do start looking for a job uh, and you start applying for different opportunities, there's going to be some kind of technical aspect to it. Um, in Facebook, that, that technical aspect is, is very intense. They have like six rounds of, of interviews, technical interviews. They have um, some phone interviews as well, and, and it's, it's very intense. Um, the other piece, um, th the other piece I, I would point out is that one of the most important skills as an engineer is the ability to learn things uh, on your own. Um, you know, you're not going to come into a job and know all the languages that you're ever going to need to use or understand all the libraries that you're going to need or, you know, everything that you'll need to, uh, all the APIs, right? And so there is a fair amount of learning that you actually do on the job and being able to to do that learning while you're at home, right? Like try practicing learning 
learning new things, uh, integrating with, with different uh, tools or libraries or, you know, working on some side projects as well. I've worked on a couple of those myself, um, even while I was, you know, while I was in NYU, um, different uh, startups, um, friends of mine had ideas that I, I tried to contribute to. And what you gain from that is you actually, it's not so much the, the, the languages uh, that you know, but it's more um, the skills you pick up in being able to learn new things quickly. Um, so those are the two pieces. The one thing I would say um, that you shouldn't do during this time is pivot uh, to something that you uh, aren't passionate about, right? So don't use this Corona experience as an opportunity to just, oh, I'm going to go into engineering, even though you don't enjoy coding or you don't enjoy a lot like that kind of logical thinking. Because, um, and I've seen this a couple of times uh, throughout my career is that uh, if you're not passionate about the work you're doing, uh, you won't last long and you won't enjoy it. You know, your team won't, won't enjoy it as well. And it, it gets very, um, and then you'll, you'll wish you, you hadn't done that. So I would say um, to, to keep, um, keep shooting for what you're passionate about um, and don't make any hard pivots uh, to something like that. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Pinter. Um, I think uh, I really wanna just uh, repeat a lot of what Jason said. I think if you're if you're looking to get into something and you're concerned that you the job market isn't going to be great soon, I think uh, an unpaid internship or any way that you can provide value for a company in the field that you want is where you should go. Um, whether that's give, volunteering your time or finding some way to provide value to them to show that you're uh, that you are someone that they could hire going forward. So it's not easy in every industry. Uh, it's certainly harder in uh, medicine and in uh, uh, big, uh, large uh, software corporations, but in smaller companies like mine, I've had people who've offered their 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 time to me, and I've give, and I've been able to evaluate uh, whether they could be someone that that, uh, that could help me, and we have hired people from that. So that's something I would suggest, um, and I think Jason really uh, said it best. So I'm going to end. All right, well, I appreciate you all sharing these perspectives that are all very valuable things for our participants to strongly consider doing at this time. And uh, what, what I'd like to do is participants, if you go into the chat, you're gonna see a to everyone option. What I'd like for you to do is put in your question, instead of uh, general questions for the whole panel, because we are short on time, if you can make your questions specific to a panelist, we maybe can do one to two, if not three questions. Uh, so please type in a question. We're gonna give a moment or two so that we could get your question answered. We have a couple more seconds. I have one question already, but we'll wait for some more. Okay. So one question I have was from one of our participants. They asked, if, what if you don't have the grades for graduate school? So I'm not, I can't speak to what this person's specific plans are and if it is necessary for them to go to graduate school. Um, but if, if one or two of our panelists, if you could consider, what if you don't have the grades for graduate school? How might you respond, pivot as a person who's looking to get the education? So I didn't go to graduate school, so I'm not sure if I'm the best to answer this question. Um, or maybe that does make me qualified. Um, I personally haven't found uh, that in my career I, I've needed that higher education to do what I do. Um, it's something that I think about uh, if I would go for a master's uh, related to my field. Um, I do think about it quite often. I haven't made that jump yet. Uh, again, I haven't found that uh, that it's been necessary um, or worth the investment. If you think about, you know, in many cases, the the programs that uh, have a, a better reputation often have a cost associated. And if you, you know, 
think about, you know, Barry said about the data, you do the math and you think about you know, how long will it take me to earn that money back financially if I was to get that master's and I get an increase in salary or something, or I get a new position that comes with a higher salary. You know, does it, how long does it take you to make back a uh, 50 or $100,000 in net cash? Um, so for myself, um, unlike, you know, medicine or other, or, or law where you, you have no choice but to go to a, a graduate school for those, uh, I personally haven't found that in my career in, in, in the ad tech industry uh, that I've needed that in order to, to move forward and move up. Thank you, sir. I think there, you know, I know that it's easy for me to say with unfortunate, with either fortunately or unfortunately multiple degrees. Um, it's, but I think there's other things to do in healthcare that you don't need to get a graduate degree in. Um, there are things like nursing, which you get a bachelor's in science in nursing, which isn't a graduate degree, um, which that comes with it a very, very good job with a lot of job security. Um, I think that people don't even think about being a firefighter and a paramedic, which again, doesn't require even an undergraduate degree. Um, it requires two years of college, some type of college or two years of the army usually. And then you can go into doing that. Um, and there's people who have very successful careers in healthcare uh, related to that. Uh, somehow, sometimes get into sales, um, get into business of healthcare um, with the, with, once they've been a paramedic for uh, several years. Um, so there are ways to get into healthcare without being graduate, without having a graduate degree. Um, I mean, a, a, doing a physician's assistant isn't actually considered a graduate degree either, um, it, but it's post-college. Um, and that's also another way to, to, to get into treating patients. So I think that there are multiple ways. I, I, I don't think that you should, people should think just because I'm a physician, that, you know, the, I'm the only person who treats patients. I'm not. Um, and we can't do it with the other people as, uh, either. So I think people should consider that. Okay, thank you. We've, we've got one more question, and this is for Dr. Barry, and I'll, I'll read it. It said, you mentioned continued use of telemedicine after the virus subsides. How do you see the process of seeing patients changing more long-term with the connection to admission to hospitals outside of these visits? And would this be sustainable as a career change slash path to do mostly telemedicine? So um, it's, a, it's a good question. I think that um, there's multiple different arenas of telehealth. Um, we have telehealth, which we call synchronized. We have asynchronized telehealth. Um, synchronized telehealth would be the way that I'm talking to you right now. Asynchronized would be more like texting or typing. Um, and so there's different venues associated with I do. I've worked in the Rolls Royce where we have uh, stethoscope that I can listen to heart and lungs. We have fiber optic scopes to look into your throat, into your ears, into your skin. So I could do a pretty much a full physical exam. Um, and then I do stuff as much as asynchronous, which is, which is a very te is texting oriented. So I think that um, moving forward, I think that the, 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 the uh, nursing home uh, telehealth, which has taken off a little bit prior to this is now going to become huge. Um, I think that hospice medicine, which had no telehealth associated, and that was a governmental issue, uh, since most, tele, most um, hospice patients are Medicare, um, will now, I think telehealth will become an inroad to that, um, which is, again, a huge population in America. We have 1.5 million people on hospice care and growing every day. Um, and nursing homes, I don't have to tell, most people know just by their own families that, they're, that that's a growing industry with the baby boomers becoming older. Um, and then we're going to do things like preoperative patients um, are going to be done by telehealth. Um, we even implemented telehealth in the emergency department. So people that we think can be seen in just out of the waiting room, instead of coming into the emergency, being exposed to the entire emergency department, we can do telehealth in that regard. Um, urgent care and those low lying fruits of non-urgent, non-emergent care um, is, um, um, it, it, it will continue as it is right now. Um, and then you have the arenas that we consider uh, lifestyle medicine, which again is a different form of medicine. Um, and most people are saying, what is lifestyle medicine? So lifestyle medicine are the Viagra's, Propecia, things to do with uh, hair, hair loss, uh, erectile dysfunction, um, uh, birth control. Um, all of that is considered lifestyle medicine. And that's also done a lot by telehealth, um, anonymously, I mean, to some degree anonymously. Um, so that people have privacy when it comes to sensitive issues like that. So I think te telemedicine is, is, is really going everywhere now. Um, we're even starting a program, I'm starting a program with um, people in Zimbabwe about doing teleradi teleradiology, 
with ultrasound and a company called Butterfly, which are the which is on the cutting edge of uh, artificial intelligence and ultrasonography, um, and we're and we're looking to do a telehealth program with uh, underserved communities in uh, rural Zimbabwe um, for prenatal care. Um, so this is it, it really goes almost anywhere these days, and you know there's remote surgeries and stuff like that, robotics, and, but I'm not involved in that at all. But that's a whole different form of kind of telehealth. Um, you know, if that person wants to talk offline, I'm happy to talk with them um, about this uh, to get into a little bit more because I know the time is a bit of an issue. Dr. Barry, thank you very much. And, and that's a perfect segue to this next portion of the, of the panel to begin wrap up is uh, this should be the start of a bigger conversation for each of you who are participating as attendees in this event um, to strongly consider what you learned today, internalize it and figure out where it fits into their own, uh, into your own plans, whether they are short term or long term, simply figuring out how you're going to navigate the, the pandemic as it relates to your career goals, or how you're going to figure out the rest of your time at YU or in graduate school, or in your career. Uh, places that these panelists are accessible are in are, are two major ones. Uh, one of which is YU MVP, which is designed for undergraduate students to join and contact volunteer mentors such as these gentlemen and many others who are on that network that are waiting to hear from undergraduate students. If you have not joined already, you can join with your mail.yu.edu address and you can begin to access this network of professionals who many of which, many, many of which are alumni such as these panelists who are waiting to hear from you to have conversations like this. It's all virtual and it's accessible to each of you as undergraduate students. If you are a graduate student or you are a alumni and you're looking for continued support, and this is for everyone, the Career Center is very much open and we're accessible virtually. So we would like you to know very much so that we're waiting to hear from you. Our advising team is waiting to have meetings with you and we have met with students over the past couple of weeks that this has transitioned to a virtual remote uh, um, resource in many ways. And alumni, if you are in, in the house today, they, they, we have lifetime services for our alumni. Um, so those are, those are two major things to know, but definitely in addition to YU MVP, these panelists are also on LinkedIn. And um, there are ways that if you've never reached out to someone before on LinkedIn or YU MVP, and you consider that to be a cold contact in a way, um, you can speak to an advisor on the team who can help you to devise ways that you can do that in a professional manner to request some time to do informational interviews or follow up on these conversations. Um, so we're here for you for that manner. This was a inaugural event for the YU Career Center Professional Series, of which there are going to be weekly events that are going to be styled similarly to this. They may be panels, they may be fireside chats, they may be workshops, and many different um, events that we are doing to provide for, provide for YU students during this time. Um, so these four panelists are really, if we were in person, it'd be a giant round of applause for our panelists today. I would imagine that um, if you had stuck around, you got a lot of information. In addition to the professional series events, we do have finance recruiting in today's climate on May 5th. We also have an evening with Morgan Stanley on May 13th. We will have information about those events and all of our other events uh, on and career center newsletters that are going to be launching uh, very soon that are going to be composed of information that's going to be relative to or, or relevant rather to you as uh, people who are seeking some career support and to know what our office is doing for you. Um, we do have also a Yeshiva University Career Center LinkedIn group that's going to have some information on there as well that's very pertinent to each of you or can be very pertinent to each of you. Um, gentlemen, again, thank you very much for serving as our panelists and for volunteering in the MVP network. Uh, thank you to our participants for joining us today and colleagues who may have also been in the participant group Gentlemen, I'll be in touch with you moving forward. Uh, and uh, participants will be in touch with you to ask you how this event was. We'll, be, uh, we'll all be in touch. Big note to everybody, be well, be safe, good health to you all. And um, we will hopefully cross paths very soon, hopefully uh, in person to chat about how we can uh, support you. All right, so thanks again, everybody. Really appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Thank right. you. Take care. Bye-bye.